Well, hello, everybody. Good to see you here on this incredible weekend that we have. Man, I have been praying for you all week long. I, you know, I, I don't think I'd tell you enough. There's an old song out there that says, have I told you lately that I love you? And I just want you to know I love you so much. I think about you all the time. And it's really, Tatum and I, it's our delight and it's our honor to be on this journey with you. We, we really do. We love you. We're so excited where God has taken us to. Also, I want to extend that same welcome and love to those that are watching us online. You are a part of this church family, as well as all of the men and women in all of our Department of Corrections around America. Come on, everybody. Come on, let's make them feel real welcome today on this holiday weekend. God bless you guys. All right, well, hey, uh, I want to encourage you to pull up your message notes that are on your Life of Fellowship app so you can follow along and then email that to yourself later on. And while you're doing that, let me just let you know that we're just a couple weeks away, and I'm so excited for our water baptism celebration. Already there are scores of people that have registered. We have people that are flying in to be a part of this. It's going to be an amazing day. It kicks off on August 4th. Baptisms are going to happen that morning. We're going to do it in a way we've never done it before. That's the beginning of 21 days of prayer. And then that night is our pursuit night. And we're going to see heaven touch our, our lives in great ways. And then also, let me just tell you this, because I'm going out of my mind with excitement because we are just seven weeks away from the launching of our Anna campus. Hey, everybody, like we've been preparing for the last year diligently behind the scenes. So we've made staff hires. We've separated our staff into central staff and campus staff. We've created all kinds of systems and structures. All of the, the equipment is going to be de uh, deployed here in the next couple weeks. It's being delivered, and we are so excited. And if you would like to be a part of our launch team, that we are going to take this city for Christ. I double dog dare you to come on, everybody. Text Anna to 510. I'm telling you, Pastor John and the entire team is doing a stupendous job, and we're going to see incredible results. It's going to pay incredible dividends, the effort and the prayers and the focus that we're giving to this city. You watch and see what God does. We're doing this together. Now, this series that we've been in is a very unique series. We're calling it Book Club because every single week is an individual message that we actually have an accompanying book to it. So, in other words, if the message topic of today intrigues you, and you think, my goodness, I'd like to go a little deeper on this, then we're offering different books throughout this series that you can just order, pick up, and then go on a deeper dive. Today's book is called The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. This is a classic. This is in my office. In fact, it's one of the very first books that I read that developed this incredible hunger on the inside of me for more of God. And if you'll just scan that, you can pick that book up, and it, I promise you it'll touch your heart at the deepest point possible. Because I truly believe that today is going to be an anchor message in your heart and life. And when I say an anchor message, what I mean by that is that sometimes God comes along and he gives us messages that actually have a profound, deep impact on our lives that actually change the trajectory of your life. And I got to warn you today because the prayer that we are going to study is not some safe, benign prayer. It's actually a very dangerous prayer. Because how many of you would agree with me today that most of the prayers that we pray in America are very safe, right? Like, Lord, bless me, safe. Lord, help me, safe. Oh, God, give us traveling mercies as we drive to Grandma's house. Doubly safe, right? But the prayer that I want to give you today is not a safe one. I think it's a very risky one. And it actually comes from the life of King David. So there was a point that his enemies were 
attacking him, and they were, they were accusing him of having wrong motives in his heart. And what's incredible to me is that David didn't try to defend himself. Instead, he prayed this very risky prayer. And this is what he said. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way that's everlasting. Now, here's the deal. As we study this, in order for us to digest it, I'm going to actually break it into four different parts. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I really want this to be bite-sized pieces for all of us so it's not just something that we hear in a message today, but it's actually something that we, we put into practice every single day this next week. And the very first thing that David prayed was this. Number one, God, I'm asking you to search my heart. In fact, he said it very directly there. Look at what he said. Search me, God, and know my heart. And I know what some of you guys are thinking. You're thinking, why in the world do I need to pray that if God already knows my heart? And by the way, I'm all, I'm, I, I got a good heart. You got a good heart? I got a good heart? We all got good hearts, right? Well, the truth is, you actually, without Christ, you don't have a good heart. And we hear it said all the time. People say it all the time. Oh, she's got such a really good heart. Now, if you want to be biblically correct about it, she actually has a wicked heart. That's what she's got. Without Christ, you got a wicked heart. That's why the Bible comes along in Jeremiah and says that the human heart is, is what? It is the most deceitful of all things, and what else? Desperately wicked. Like, who really knows how bad it is? And you need to understand today that without Christ, without God in your life, your heart is not good. Your heart is bad. Let me tell you something. We are all liars. We all have wicked hearts. In fact, how many of you would be willing to admit today that you're a liar. Come on, put your hand up. Come on, put, put your hand up. If you, if you would admit today you're a liar. Come on, keep it up. Keep it up and look around. See somebody, let them know. Come on, tell them. Lie, liar, pants on fire. Just tell them that. Because you're a liar. You lie, 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 lie. I mean, we, and I would say today that the most common lies that we believe are the ones that we tell ourselves. So we say all the time, man, I don't eat a lot. Excuse me, look at your plate. I, I really don't have a drinking problem. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, you drink a bottle of wine every single night. I, I don't have a pride issue in my life. It just happens to be that every room that I walk into, I just happen to be the brightest, smartest, most talented person in every single room. I can't help that. I don't have a lust problem. I just enjoy looking at finer physiques. I'm not materialistic. I just need nice things all the time. I think some of the most common lies that we believe are the ones that we tell ourselves. And I think God is wanting us to get to the point that we come after him and say, God, search my heart. Because I don't want to be a fake person. I want to be authentic. I want to be real. Like, tell me what's actually going on on the inside of there. Because I got some blind spots in my life. I think that's why the Apostle Paul, he said this in 2 Corinthians. He said, I'm refusing to wear masks. So, so in other words, I'm not going to spend my time and my energy hiding, I'm actually going to spend my energy, energy fixing things. I'm done playing games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. Rather, we keep everything that we do and say, 
out in the open. In fact, years ago when I first came to pastor the church, um, <laughs> I, I was not only the pastor of the church, I was also the receptionist. And so a lot of times, you know, the calls would come in and I'd pick it up and say, hey, thanks for calling Life Fellowship Church. Can I help you? And they're like, can, can I please speak to the pastor? I'm like, just one minute. <clears throat> Hello, this is Pastor Chris. <laughs> yeah. And so one time I got this call from this guy. He called up and he said, hey, um, Pastor Chris, could, uh, do you do counseling? And, and I said, yeah, I, I would love to help you. I said, but, but, but before we go down that road, can, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, do you have a church home? He said, yeah. I, he said, I'm, in fact, I'm very connected in with my, with my church. So I told him, I said, well, listen, it's not that I wouldn't like to help you, but I would really encourage you to go to your pastor or to the pastor that you're best connected with at that church because the ones that know you the best are able to help you the most. To which he replied, he said, oh no, he said, I could never let them know what I'm going through. And when he said that, I knew in my heart, that's your problem, my man. And in all these years of ministry, 25 plus years, I've had calls like that, conversations like that, probably 10 to 15 different times. So we want everybody to think that we're something publicly, but we need to go get help somewhere else. And God looks at all of us today out of this prayer and says, hey, everybody, let me just beg you, stop playing games with me. Like, invite me in, because your God is the ultimate gentleman. He will not go where he's not invited. And when you open your heart and you say, oh, God, please come. You search me. Find the inner part of who I am. Like, show me my blind spots, my deaf spots, my dumb spots. Because if you could see your blind spots, they wouldn't be blind anymore. And God just revealed that to me, because the most common lies that we believe are the ones that we tell ourselves. The second thing that King David prayed is, he said, God's reveal my fears. So in other words, he looked at God, and he actually says it here directly. He says, search me, God, know my heart, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. Everybody look in my eyes. What? makes you anxious? What makes you worried? What are you afraid of? And I'm not talking about snakes and spiders. You know what I'm talking about? And, and the guy that's hanging in you know, behind your shower curtain that you think is going to wake up in the middle of the night and come and get you, which I'm going to tell you he's never there because I check every single time. <laughs> I'm telling you, every time I walk into a bathroom, I walk in locked and loaded, baby. Man, I'm checking. And let me say this. If any one of you ever think about being that person in my life that is behind that shower curtain, I'm telling you, I walk into every single bathroom ready. Man, I am ready. I am re I'm just, whoa! What makes you anxious? What makes you worried? What is it that you're afraid of? Maybe you're afraid that you're going to lose your job. Maybe, maybe you're afraid that your marriage is going to fall apart. Maybe, maybe you're afraid of the future. Maybe you're afraid of failing. Maybe you're afraid of that your kids aren't going to turn out the way that you wanted them to turn out. What is it that you are afraid of? Why would we need to pray, God, show me my anxious thoughts? I love what a pastor, Craig Groeschel, said. He said, what we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. I want you to think about that for a second. What you fear the most reveals where you trust God the least. What are you afraid of? 
Maybe you're afraid that your marriage, you're going to fall out of love and it's no longer going to be a good marriage. Well, that just reveals that you're not trusting God enough with your marriage. Or maybe you believe that you're not going to be able to provide and pay all of your bills, that your business is not going to succeed. Well, that reveals where you're trusting God the least. Maybe you're thinking that your kids are not going to turn out right, that God is not able to protect them, provide for them, comfort them, be with them. Well, that is actually revealing where you are trusting God the least. Because what we fear the most reveals where we trust God the least. So every single day this past week, this is the prayer that I've been praying. Search me, God. Know my heart. Reveal to me my anxious thoughts. And here's what's crazy. As I have prayed this prayer all week long, seven days this past week, God has revealed something to me about my biggest fear that honestly I'm not proud of. Because if I could just be real with you today, my biggest fear, I am scared to death of failing. So if I ever do succeed, chances are going to be pretty strong that the reason for that success is because I just fear failing so bad. And as I was praying through that this week, it just became very real to me that just beneath the surface of my fear of failure is the fact that I don't want to disappoint anybody. Like, I, I, I really work hard to not to not disappoint people. And then as I was praying through this, God revealed to me the deepest level of this fear. And that is that I fear being inadequate. So like I have this deep-seated fear on the inside of me that I'm just not gonna be enough. That, that I'm not gonna be gifted enough, wise enough, enough. I'm not gonna have enough leadership. I'm not gonna have enough talent. I'm not gonna have enough foresight. I'm not gonna be, have enough strategy. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be enough to take, to take the church where we need to go. I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to be enough. And so because of that fear, I have discovered in my own life that there's been times that I have sought to please people rather than pleasing God. And how sick is that as a pastor to have to admit that to you today? Because you see, as a pastor, I can't be led by my fear. I have to be led by faith. Because without faith, it's impossible possible to please God. And I'm just going to tell you that there have been times in my life that God has spoken to me about something, and I've not told a single person about it because I've been so scared, and I've been driven by my fear rather than being led by the Spirit of God in my life. And I don't know if that's giving you too much information about me today. I'm so sorry if it is, but it's real therapeutic for me, all right? <laughs> And so as I was praying this week, this is what God showed me. I have to love pleasing God. I have to love being obedient to him more than I fear failing. And that was really powerful to me. And so what I've been doing for these last couple of weeks is I've actually been praying and reciting God's word to renew my mind over and over. I, I, I've been reciting out of 1 John where it says that perfect love casts out all fear. I've been quoting 2 Timothy that says that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And here's what I double dog dare you to do. I dare you to pray and ask God, search my heart, O oh God. And see if there is any anxiousness on the inside of me. And here's what I can promise you God's going to do. He is going to reveal things to you that for years and years and years and years and years, for some of you, you've not been willing to acknowledge. But he's going to show those things to you. And when he does, that's going to be the time that you begin to experience 
freedom because he's going to expose the work of the enemy, that fear that is trying to cripple you and hold you back because God wants to set you free so that you can soar on the wings of eagles because one of the most common lies that we believe is the ones that we, we tell ourselves. Which then brings me to the third stage in what David prayed. He said, God, uncover my sins. And he gets really risky on this prayer. And notice what he says here. He says, see if there is any offensive way in me. So in other words, God, show me if there is anything that I am doing that is displeasing you. Now, here's what I need you to know. Watch this, everyone. It's really, really, really hard to see your own sins in a mirror. Right? But it's really easy to see everybody else's. Oh, my goodness. Look at her. Every time she walks in the room, she acts like she is hot stuff. Oh my goodness, look at the way that he, he always is pontificating. He always thinks that he knows the most. He speaks down to everybody like he's the one of God's best, the way that he acts. Oh, look at that. Look at their attitude. But me? <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm the blessed holy child of the Lord. Like me and Jesus, man, we are one. Like we are close as can be. Like, it's really hard to see our faults and our sins when we look in the mirror. But it's really easy to point it out in everybody else. I'll say it like this, that we tend to accuse others and we tend to excuse ourselves. It's really easy to see everybody else's sin, but it's really hard to see our own. I'll give you a crazy example of this. So years ago, I was... Driving down 75, I was stuck in bumper-to-bumper traffic. I mean, it was horrendous. And I was, it was, I was there, and I'm just trying to just occupy myself. And so I just started, I actually started making fun of other drivers. So another, have you ever been in standstill traffic, and there are those people that they will come out of the line and start driving down the right shoulder of the road. How many of y'all have ever seen somebody like that? So I'm, so I'm looking at these people. They're driving. I start making fun of them. I start saying, man, who do you think you are, big man? You, know, you, you little sports car, Mr. VIP, breaking the law. Well, I'm a law-abiding, God-fearing American. I'm in line. <laughs> So I'm just making fun of them. Two days later, I'm on 75. I'm about 50 yards away from my exit, right about Stacy Road. I'm trying to get home. There is an accident for about 15 minutes. Nothing moved. I was getting frustrated. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And then I looked outside of the passenger driver's window. I saw just a little strip of grass. Yeah, y'all are already going where I'm thinking. And then there's the service road there. So I start thinking to myself, God made that grass. (laughs) And I am a servant of the Most High God. So it practically belongs to me. So I pull out of the line. I start going down the right shoulder of the road. I'm picking up speed. I'm passing by all kinds of cars. And I swerve onto the grass. Dirt is flying everywhere. I hop on to the service road. I'm thinking to myself, Chris, you are the coolest guy in the world. Until I look on over. And traveling right beside me, who was traveling down the service road, happens to be somebody that's staring at me, who attends Life Fellowship Church. (laughs) 
Less than 48 hours. How many of you all know we all have wicked hearts? You see, the most common lie that we believe is the one that we tell ourselves. And I just want to say this. That's why it takes tremendous courage to look to God and say, God, I'm, I'm giving you free reign to expose my sin in my life. Show me any offensive way on the inside of me. And I can promise you this, that if you'll have the courage to pray that prayer, God will begin to reveal things to you. And when he does, I'm going to challenge you to ask yourself three questions. Number one, what are those who love me trying to tell me? So in other words, who are the three or four or five people that really love you, that want to see you win and succeed? What are they saying to you? And if they are all saying the same thing, then you ought to pay attention to that. Because if three or four or five different people all separate say the same thing, the common factor is you. And you ought to pay attention to that. The second thing that you ought to ask yourself is, what have I normalized for some time? In other words, hey, I know this is not right, but this is just who I am. This is just what I do. I'm not hurting anybody. It's none of anybody else's business. I do what I do. It's not affecting anybody. And you've normalized something in your life that you know is not right. You know it shouldn't be a part of your life. And then the third question you should ask is, where am I the most defensive? Listen, I don't want to talk about that, period. I'm not discussing that anymore. We are done. Get out of my business. Don't judge. Don't judge me. Don't you, don't you dare point your finger at me. Where is it in your life that you are the most defensive? I think these are indicators in our lives. In fact, this kind of reminds me of of something that I tried to deny for the longest time, personally. And, and honestly, I've told a version of this story before, but I'm, but I'm going to tell it again. So for those of you that have been around here for any period of time, you'll know that there was, um, there was a time in our church that I was a whole lot funnier than I am today. Like a whole lot funnier. And that's because I would say things that would be kind of edgy. I'd say things that would, that would kind of cross the line. Sometimes it would be even just a little bit crude. And I've, I've gotten a lot better at this. And yet, even, even though I try to get better at this, there's been times that people, man, they'll come up to me and they just let me know, man, you, you crossed the line. But I, I, I've really tried. I've, I've tried my best. And the reason why I would do that is because I've always wanted to create a place where people could come to church and it's not just some normal church and they could just feel comfortable and they'd know, hey man, he's speaking my language. He's talking, he's talking to me like kind of, like, that I can relate to this. But even any time that I would ever cross the line, people come up to me and they would let me know, like you just, you crossed the line. That was a little too edgy. You're going to hell. <laughs> They tell me, like, you're going to hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and where the worm never dies. And so, honestly, I, I, I would never receive that kind of correction in my life because it just doesn't do anything to my heart. But I've, after that, I had probably about four or five different people all individually come to me and just let me know, hey, Chris, I think that there's times that you say things that you kind of just, you cross the line just a little bit too much. Just, it's just a little bit too edgy. And I started thinking about that. And then the one that just absolutely revolutionized me. I'd gone to lunch with one of the business leaders in the church. He sat down. He was incredibly encouraging. He's like, Chris, I just need you to know this church has changed my life. He said, I got healed in this church. I got to baptize my 15-year-old son here. This church has changed 
my life. And then he leaned forward and he said this. He said, but I would just ask you, would you just please pray and ask God if if God would speak to you about some of the words that you're saying from the platform, if they're actually setting a good example for, for other people. And he said, whatever God tells you, he said, I'm with you. Whatever God reveals to you, I'm with you. Heart and soul, I ain't going anywhere. I got your back. I'm with you through thick and thin. And I'm going to be honest with you that when he said that to me, I thought, man, I like that approach. Like, I really like that a lot. So I told him, I said, man, I promise you, I'll, I'll pray. Now, let me be transparent with you. I didn't pray like 20, 30 minutes. I, I prayed for like five seconds. I said, God, just show me if there's something I'm doing wrong. Amen. The next Sunday, I'm up preaching. Man, I've got a zinger. I mean, your sinful side would have really loved it. Like, it, it, it might have been like a couple steps before crossing the line. It might have even been on the line. It might have even been a couple steps beyond the line. <laughs> and, and I was just getting ready to say it when I had this thought to myself. What would my mama think if she was sitting in the front row? And I said, man, I can't say that. And all of a sudden, God took the loving confrontation of a brother in Christ coupled with the wonderful Holy Spirit, and he changed me. Now, here's what I can tell you. I know that some of you are thinking, you know, hey, Chris, we're okay that you're a little borderline sometimes. We kind of, we like it when you're a little bit, little bit edgy. And I'll just say, you have no idea how much I hold back. So you just keep praying for you, and I'll just keep praying for me, all right? <laughs> In fact, you pray for me too, all right? And, and let me just say this. The, if you're perfect, this is not your church. So if you think that you're holy and perfect, then I'm going to tell you, you can go polish your halo at some other place. This is not the shrine for the saints. This is a hospital for the brokenhearted. This is a place where imperfect people come, and we come in contact with the perfect God, and he changes us on the inside. And then we get real, and we get transparent with one another. Everybody, I want you to hear what I just said to you here today. I want to get honest with you. My greatest Fear is the fear of failing. I'm scared to death of that. And just below the surface of that is because I don't want to disappoint you. And God revealed to me this last week that the reason why I don't want to disappoint people is because I have this fear of being inadequate, that I just am never going to be enough. I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough, strategic enough. I can't see enough. I can't leave well enough. I'm not, I'm not people-oriented enough. I'm just not enough. And so because of that, there's times that I work really hard to please people rather than pleasing God. How troubling is that for a pastor to admit but yet, here's what I've discovered, that when I get honest about who I am, and I let God search my heart, and point out my anxious ways, and expose my sin, it doesn't lead me away from Christ. It actually draws me to him, because I see how much I actually need him in my life. So let me ask you, what is it for you? What is the area of your life that you need the power of God? What is it? You need the power of God to break addiction. The power of God to break that pride off of your life. The power of God to break that lust that continues to dominate your thoughts thoughts, the, the power of God to break materialism off of your life. And I promise you this, that if you'll finally open up your heart to God, and when he shows you those things, it won't lead you away from God. It'll actually 
draw you to him because you're going to discover your incredible need of a savior in your life. Which brings me to the very last thing that David prayed. And that's this. He said, lead me. So after God showed him what needs to be changed, Look at what he said. He said, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In fact, once again, let me show you the progression of this here today. It always begins with you and I coming before God and we say, God, please search me. Because I want to remind you today that God is the ultimate gentleman. He will never force salvation on your life. He'll never force life change on your life. He will never push himself on you until you open your heart up to him. And if you will be bold enough and courageous enough today to say, God, please just begin to search me because I know that there's things about me that I can't see. It's the beginning of wisdom. And the minute that you say that, it gives God permission to begin to Reveal to you the things about your life, your, your greatest fears. Because your greatest fear reveals where you trust God the least. And you look up to God and you say, God, I can't believe that I've been in this place and I'm not trusting you like I am and I've been allowing this fear to dominate my life and I found myself sitting down. There, there are so many horizons. There's a blue ocean in front of you. There are more ideas, more potential. There's more gold on the inside. There is purpose. You are dripping with the purpose of God. And yet your fear is hijacking the preferred future that you have on your life. And God wants to expose that so you can finally bring it before him. And he can burn it out of your life. And now you look up and say, God, I just want to be a man of God. I want to be a woman of God. Uncover my sins. And if we can just be honest as humans, that's like one of the hardest prayers to pray. But as God begins to root those things out of your life, what happens is, is now you begin to see with great clarity. And now you get to the place where you're saying, God, I want to be a difference maker. I want to lead a generation. I want to lead a movement. I, I want to lead, lead a culture of generosity. I want to see the world touched by the power of God. I'm going to lead my family and my life and my health and my finances. And, and, and I'm going to lead and walk in a way that is right before God. God, it all begins to happen and it stems from that. You see, I'll say it like this. In your early years, when you first begin to walk with God, you often get what you think are the big things out of your life. You think that they're so big, but the longer that you walk with Jesus, it actually becomes more about the little things. And what I've discovered is this, that those little things, they're actually the big things. That it's those little things that are in your life that when the Holy Spirit puts his thumb on that and says, hey, that's the part of your life that I'm looking for right there. You're going to discover that those little things actually are the big things. And when he does that, that's our moment, our point to draw close to God. The most common lies that we tell our, are the ones that we tell ourselves. So come on, I want to close today by reading this together. Come on, read this out loud to me. Every single voice, everybody in the correctional facilities, those of you online, come on, speak this out with me. Come on. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's a very risky prayer, but it's a prayer that if you will pray, it will change your life. And the people of God today said, amen and amen. So be it. Come on, won't you bow your heads, close your eyes. 
I want to get very, very real with you today in this moment. Just like what I've done this last week, every single day of the week, I prayed this prayer. If you'll be honest enough today to say, God, I promise every single day this week, I'm going to pray this prayer that King David prayed. And I'm going to ponder. I'm going to open my heart. I'm going to let God truly speak to me. If you'll be courageous enough to do that and be willing to listen to the voice of God when he speaks to you, can I have you just lift your hand and I'm going to pray for you that God is going to open up incredible, incredible doors in your heart. Look at this. Hands are up everywhere. I know they're up in the correctional facilities. So you can put your hands down. Let me pray for you, Father, in Jesus' name. Together, we ask you, please search us. Reveal to me, Lord, reveal to us our anxieties. Show us any offensive way. And then, Lord, lead us. Lead us to be difference makers. I declare that over every person that is listening to me today, in Jesus' mighty name. Just receive that. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you're away from God, maybe you've never surrendered your life to him. Maybe it's, maybe you did at one point and you walked away from him. What you're feeling right now is the very presence of a mighty God. It's the Holy Spirit. And he is leading you to him. So come on, isn't it time that you finally stop running from God and start running to God? And what you're going to discover is that God's going to wrap his arms around you. I know that you think, well, i got to get myself all cleaned up to get to God. No, let me tell you something. You're not good enough to ever do that in your life. You can't get clean enough to get to God. God will come exactly to where you're at and wrap his arms around you. And if you'll surrender your life to him, he'll start working all that other stuff out. Don't worry about that now. Just surrender. And so pray this prayer with me, if, that, if that's you. It's a prayer of surrender to, and an invitation to the Lord to change your life. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. All of it. Please change me. Make me new. Forgive me of my sins. I confess you as Savior and Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And all God's people in the house, come on, say amen and amen. Come on, can we just celebrate so many people that are giving their lives to Jesus every single week? God bless you guys.